Hey everyone, I hope you are well. I'm gonna do something that's very uncharacteristic of me to launch this video. You see, typically I take my time to investigate premises and address objections before getting to a crescendo, but this topic, the trans topic, it's built different. Hence, I thought I'd simply tell you straight up what my views on sex and gender are before building up to why I have them. So, here it is. For the reasons I'll make clear throughout this video, I think it's obvious that sex and gender are not the same thing. Sex is biological, whereas gender is a social construct, and I prefer to reserve the words male and female for sex, and man and woman for gender. Let's start with the former. I define sex based on gamete type and chromosomes, and I see sex as binary. I'll repeat that, I see sex as binary. However, it's not as simple as everyone is born with either male parts or female parts, since there are some variations. Some people, for instance, are born with an extra X chromosome, and others are born with both ovarian and testicular tissue. This is known as true hermaphroditism. So it's fair to say that there's variation. However, just as we acknowledge exceptions to a rule in many domains of discourse, so too do many biologists when it comes to sex. So, sex, per my view, is binary. And as of this time, no, you can't change your sex. To be clear, there are other definitions of sex on the table that do not entail sex being binary, and my guest today throughout this video, Forrest Falkai, is an example of a biologist, no less, that holds such a view. In our podcast, in fact, he reads out several biological textbooks backing up his view, and you'll be able to see that at a later date. But as for me, I subscribe to a binary view of sex because I think it has the most utility. Moving on to gender, here's how I view it. Gender is a social construct that heavily correlates to secondary sexual characteristics, genitalia, behaviours and aesthetics. You know, just as a castle is a social construct that heavily correlates to curtain walls, crenellations, matriculations and a moat. Or to give another example, money. Money is a social construct that heavily correlates to polymer, copper, nickel, silver, gold, etc. Now, while social constructs often refer to factual states about the world, they are not themselves inherently natural. They exist because of social norms, values, beliefs, and practices. The social construct of a castle does not tangibly exist, but the bricks and mortar do tangibly exist. Likewise, the social construct of a woman does not tangibly exist, but sexual characteristics such as white hips do exist, and so too do behaviours. And just as there's not a single necessary condition, a single attribute that dictates whether something is or is not a castle, the same is true of man and woman. A good example to illustrate this are people with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. While they are, per my view, male, that is, they have XY chromosomes and small gametes, they develop outwardly as females due to insensitivity to male sex hormones. Their testicles, in fact, are inside of them as if they were ovaries. As a result, these males are often mistaken as female at birth and are often raised as girls. In fact, if you didn't know that they had this condition, you absolutely would mistake many of them as female, as would they themselves. Now, by my lights, this one intersex condition alone demonstrates that gender is not strictly determined by chromosomes or sex organs, and thus that some males are women. So there's my view up front. It's not the only view on the table, definitely not, but it is my current stance. Now, let's get to the video. Welcome back, my fellow apes, to our series on the trans debate. We launched our first episode by emphasising that most philosophers don't accept or lean towards the biological definition of man and woman. That is, the view that A woman by definition is an adult human female. A man is an adult human male. Of course, this doesn't mean that they're right. There's been plenty of times when the experts have been mistaken. But peer disagreement calls for reflection, and it just so happens to be the case that philosophers, sociologists, and indeed many biologists, tend not to share the general population's insistence of conflating sex with gender. A woman by definition is an adult human female. Wrong. A man is an adult human male. Wrong. Now, I trust that I made clear in the last episode that I don't think there's such a thing as a right definition. Matt Walsh isn't wrong to insist on using a definition that conflates sex and gender. No, what he's wrong on is insisting that his preferred dictionary definition is authoritative. That's nonsense. That's not how definitions work. A dictionary is a document of how words are used, not what words authoritatively are. For example, literally now painfully means figuratively. 
well done humans. And what we're going to do in this episode is discuss the utility of various definitions pertaining to sex and gender, and cover why precisely the biologically conflated view of sex and gender has fallen out of favour among experts. Now, while this series relates to trans people, the point of this specific episode actually has little to do with trans people. You see, in order to convince someone that, say, a trans woman is a woman, you're first going to need to convince them that a male, that is, someone who typically has small gametes, sperm and XY chromosomes, can be a woman, and vice versa. If you can do this, then you'll be more than halfway to convincing them on the trans argument, right? I mean, put it this way, once one makes room for some males being women, they're gonna have to do some work to explain why trans women don't meet the criteria which is going to move the conversation into fresher waters. In effect, if you convince someone that some males can be women, you will have kicked down the door, or more accurately, rebutted the central premise in their position. And this is the goal for this video. I'm going to present just a few reasons for why I'm convinced that some women are males. But as for sharing why I think that trans women are women and trans men are men, I'll do this in a later episode, at a later premise, if you will. All right, with the thesis stated, let's get to it. To help tell the story of how our views on sex and gender have evolved, I'm joined by Forrest Valkai, our neighbourhood-friendly biologist and science communicator. Or, more accurately, I interviewed Forrest on the Rational Roundtable podcast, and you can expect segments of our conversation to be scattered throughout what's to come. In fact, here's a segment now. So, let's start at the very beginning. What was our ancestors' understanding of sex? What was their views? So, there's a lot that we do and don't know. Um, it's very likely that their concept of sex would have just been totally limited to their external phenotype, just whatever they could see with their eyes. But can you expand upon that? Is that like physical appearance? Is it is it morphology? What precisely is that? So your genotype is your DNA. It's just what your genome is telling your body to be. Your phenotype is what your body actually is. It is your outward presentation. Now, when we talk about phenotype in terms of sex determination in early civilizations, they're obviously not cutting anybody open to see what plumbing they have before they address them as a person. They're probably just looking on the surface level. So that's what we'd be limiting to. Indeed, our story begins with our ancestors, who based their understanding of sex and gender straight up on what they could see. For instance, they noticed that men have penises, are generally taller and broader than women, and have the ability to grow beards. And this was, frankly, the extent of our knowledge until the scientific revolution. In fact, on this note, while the concept of gender roles and identities have existed throughout all of history, it wasn't until the middle of the 20th century the word gender became a thing. When did the word gender start catching on? So the word gender became more popular in the scientific literature starting around the 1950s, but it actually goes back a little bit further than that. So that's the beginning sorted. For nearly all of human history, sex has been categorized based on observable traits, phenotype alone. If it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And no, reproduction was not a necessary condition. The Virgin Queen never had children, and yet she was still recognised as a queen, a female monarch. Until very recently then, our ancestors, and if you will, people in general, they thought that they had this sorted. Gender isn't a thing, sex is binary, and we know this from ob observation alone. But what was the first scientific discovery to broaden our understanding of sex outside of just observation? I mean, I couldn't nail down the very first one, but like there's a history of our understanding of sex developing over the course of a few centuries. Back in the 1600s, we, we discovered sperm. Back in the 1800s, we discovered eggs. So it's safe to say, then, that the first scientific discoveries vindicated the traditional binary view of sex, and with it what would come to be known as gender. We had a scientific basis gamete type, to distinguish the two sexes. But the science didn't stop there. No, in the mid-20th century, another discovery was made that further strengthened the binary view of sex. Alright, so you've got these discoveries, and then in 1905 by Nettie Stevens, she discovered uh, chromosomes, I think it was with mealworm? It, that would have been even of a stronger vindication towards this binary view of sex specifically, and because at the time they were conflating gender, like it just would have emboldened this view. At least it seems that way to me. Is that is that a fair understanding, or is my intuition wrong on that? Oh yeah, no, to totally. That's the, and that's that is exactly what we've been talking about. Is it's a, it 
it definitely vindicated this idea that, oh, look, look, you know, there's there's this kind of chromosomes for a female and there's this kind of chromosomes for a male. All right, so let's take a breather to recap. Our ancestors based sex on phenotype, and their binary view was scientifically bolstered by the discoveries of gametes and chromosomes. Men don't just have broader shoulders and beards, but, more importantly, small gametes and XY chromosomes. At long last, our binary system based on sight alone had been scientifically validated. We followed the evidence, and that's where it landed us. However, we then continued to follow the evidence, and it got us into murky waters. With the discovery of gametes and chromosomes, it seems that the question of at least human sex was answered. There's only two sexes, and you're either one or the other. Has that changed at all? And so you have this, this simplified answer and a really long and pedantic but more accurate answer. And the simplified answer is just that it's kind of fuzzy, but on a functional level, it's pretty binary. But what about the more complex, yet more accurate answer that Forrest was referring to? Well, we'll touch on this later. For now, we're done with sex. Many, including myself, but not including Forrest, subscribe to the view that sex is binary. And to be clear, I do so because I think that it has greater utility over other models, not because I think it's the correct definition. Again, there is no correct definition in this sense. So, that's the sex part done with. You're welcome. Now, go make me a sandwich. But what about gender? Why did the term gender become a thing in the mid-20th century? Well, it's for the same reason that terms like DNA, chromosomes, hormones, quantum mechanics, and special relativity became a thing. That is, we made further discoveries that are better accounted for by developing our models and indeed our language. And on this note, let's get to the discoveries that eventually led to a separation of sex and gender, shall we? Let me tell you a story, a story that's not unlike countless others that have occurred throughout the history of humanity. I want to tell you a story about Jane. Picture a woman from the 1920s, the epitome of a girly girl. She's petite and always decked out in floral prints and frilly dresses. Jane is loved by her community, is a Girl Guide leader, and is celebrated for her Girl Guide medical contributions during the First World War. Throughout her years, she's also been a respected midwife, and even though she couldn't have children of her own, her and her husband have adopted three kiddos and raised them with all the love in the world. Jane was also considered a perfect housewife, with the whole community adoring her baking. I know, sexist, but hey, the gender role of women was a little different back then. Through and through, she was, by the standards of her time, a brilliant woman. But one day, a routine checkup at the doctor's turned her world upside down. At 50 years old, Jane found out that she has testicles inside her. Yeah testicles. Unsurprisingly, this shocked her to no end, since she also had a vagina and breasts. Everything about her, in fact, presents as a typical female. Sure, she didn't have periods, but she was assured that this was due to premature ovarian failure. But no, Jane was diagnosed with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, a condition where someone is genetically male but develops female physical traits because their body doesn't react to androgens. Now, here's a question. What is Jane's community, us, to make of this bombshell of a diagnosis? Because this condition is very real. If you don't believe me, just look it up. There's some very informative content here on YouTube alone, with brave people sharing their experiences with this condition. I found out I was born without a uterus, and inside my body, I have testicles instead of ovaries. My doctors told me that I have XY chromosomes and that my body can't process testosterone. If you need a second to take that in, Imagine what it would feel like to learn that about yourself at age 10. How do you become a sexual minority? That's a great question because I would never thought I was. In my experience of being an intersex person, I didn't know I had an intersex condition until I was 14 years old. I learned everything about my AIS when I was about 16 or 17 years old. You know, I don't think I ever really thought that because I had a Y chromosome I was supposed to be a boy. So when those little tiny baby balls started making androgens, my body was just like, nope, 
we don't know what this is and it didn't know what to do with them. As always, I've left links to all the reference material in the description, and so if you're interested, be sure to check that out. Getting back to Jane, let's consider. If Jane, who had lived her whole life as a woman, was biologically male, what does that mean for her identity and her place in society? Well, if we strictly maintain the binary sex definition that you're either a man slash male or a woman slash female, a woman by definition is an adult human female, a man is an adult human male, then the fallout of Jane's diagnosis is far reaching and deeply unsettling. To just scratch the surface, we'd have to tell Jane, who's always seen herself and lived as a woman, and who we too have always seen and still would see as a woman if it wasn't for this diagnosis, that she's actually a man. We'd have to tell her kids that they don't have a mum. We'd have to tell her husband that he's been sleeping with a man, and since, at the time, we don't recognise same-sex marriage, we'd have to dissolve their union. What's more, we'd also have to kick her out of Girl Guides, a group that, back then, was just for girls. And, of course, we'd also have to take back her Guides War service badge that she received for her efforts during the Great War. We'd also have to insist that she's no longer a midwife, that her financial stability completely crumbled. We'd also have to make her use the men's bathroom, and, since at the time clothes were strictly divided by gender, we'd have to take away her dresses and ribbons and make her wear men's clothing. Now, I propose that this path is not just cruel, but in terms of cold utility alone, it's untenable. I mean, here's another consideration. If we stick strictly to the traditional conflated definition of sex and gender, we end up eliminating heterosexual men altogether. That's right, we'd have to declare that straight men don't exist. What's that? You're a male who's attracted exclusively to females. Oh no you're not. You don't get aroused by sniffing the gamete type of people, do you? You don't have glasses that scan chromosomes. No, you're attracted chiefly to secondary sexual characteristics. Breasts, wide hips, etc. And guess what? Some males have those features, and because you're attracted to some males, you're bisexual. And even if you want to insist that it's specifically female genitalia that you're attracted to, then recall that Jane has a vagina. You're bisexual, my dude. So do you or do you not have a vagina? That's what I'm trying to I do. I do have a vajayjay, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Indeed, to reiterate, a heterosexual is someone sexually or romantically attracted exclusively to the other sex. However, if gender means the same thing as sex, and if we define sex based on gamete type or chromosomes, then, since heterosexual men are attracted to males with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, heterosexual men don't exist. And that's pretty gay. Now, this isn't a small price to pay, is it? No, it's enormous. If you view sex and gender as the same thing, and insist that it's binary and based on gamete type and chromosomes, then you've just deleted all heterosexual men. That's what your commitments entail. However, if you simply say that, alright, Jane is a male because she has typical male gametes and or chromosomes, but she's also a woman because she fits enough of the characteristics and attributes we consider a woman, then we don't need to take away her Girl Guide medal, force her into the men's changing room, and, you know, eliminate all heterosexual men. Nor, of course, do we need to create a society that so needlessly mistreats people like Jane. We can have our cake and eat it too, we can distinguish sex from gender. We can say that sex relates to gamete type and chromosomes, whereas gender is a social construct that heavily correlates with secondary sexual characteristics, genitalia, behaviours, and aesthetics. There, heterosexual men exist. So there's just one discovery made in the last 100 years that's caused many biologists, sociologists, and philosophers to reconsider the traditional binary and conflated view of sex and gender. But there has been many more discoveries. In fact, there are over 30 intersex variations. Now, do most of these intersex conditions produce something as extreme as complete androgen insensitivity syndrome? No, they don't. But they compound the point. Just as the discovery of the platypus made scientists rethink what they consider to be a mammal, and just as the discovery of Eris caused scientists to update what they consider a planet, it is my view, and the view of many before me, that the discovery of intersex conditions like complete androgen insensitivity syndrome absolutely warrant relooking at how we look at sex and gender. So what are some of the discoveries that led to a recognition of 
gender being a social uh, construct and how it's split from sex because this is where a lot of people are and they don't understand why you would want to separate sex from gender and i feel like going through some of the discoveries the basic by my lights made it so that you have to split them um would be interesting for people to hear yeah so there's there's a lot of we talked a little bit ago about like how all the different things that go into sex are variable and not a single one of them has only two options so for example you know we've talked about okay there's xx and xy well there's also Klinefelter syndrome where you have xxy and you can also have xyy and you can also have sawyer uh, uh, turner syndrome where you have x and, and then nothing else after that and you can also have sawyer syndrome where you have xy but you still have a female phenotype and there have been women who have sawyer syndrome who have gotten pregnant and given birth to healthy babies these are xy humans who are having children or getting pregnant because they have a female phenotype. There's De La Chapelle syndrome, where you have XX chromosomes, and yet you have a male presentation. And sometimes that's because all or some of the SRY gene, which is a really important gene for sex determination on the Y chromosome, gets translocated over onto an X chromosome. Um, I think I said X twice there. Uh, the SRY gene is a really important gene for sex termination on the Y chromosome. It gets translocated over onto the X chromosome, either in whole or in part. But that doesn't always necessarily happen because every single person has the genes for both ovaries and testes and for male and female development. And it all happens upstream. There's a long genetic cascade that leads eventually to the body plan that you have today. So even without that, you can still have these changes because the sex chromosomes alone are neither necessary nor sufficient for proper male or female development in this way. I'm not saying health-wise, but like for that kind of development, it's just not enough. And so as we started to come to terms with these things and we found people with, you know, uh, a, a complete androgen and sensitivity syndrome where the, the you know, male hormones they have in their body simply don't have any effect on their body because they don't have the cell receptors for it. And so they still develop a female body. Or vice versa, you have somebody like we talked about Picos a minute ago, where you have, you know, a, definitely a female body, but you end up developing things like facial hair and whatnot. As we started to get to understand these things more and more, we kind of had to continue saying, yeah, but you're still a girl because of these things. Or yeah, you're still a boy, though, even though you have these feminine traits or these feminine characteristics or these feminine hormones or, or chromosomes or whatever. Yeah, but you're still a boy because of these other things over here. Um, you can look at people with... Um, Oh, God, what's it called? Persistent Mullerian duck syndrome. You look at you know, men with persistent Mullerian duck syndrome, they could have part or even an entire uterus inside their body. Are they both sexes or are they just a dude who has an interesting thing going on with them? You know what I mean? And so when you see people this way, you realize that in order to treat them the way that we would treat a man or a woman in society, you necessarily have to separate them from their sex a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to have to go around defining 30,000 new sexes and having a bunch more stamps on somebody's ID card, and that just isn't functional. To repeat what I said in my opening, even if one was to drop the binary and conflated view of sex and gender that Matt Walsh and many others hold, this wouldn't mean that one would necessarily accept trans people. That's true. Yes, but it would make it harder not to. Why? Well, the primary reason so many won't earnestly call a trans man a man or a trans woman a woman is because they're holding on to the traditional binary view of sex that conflates sex and gender. Now, as I made clear in the first episode, there's no such thing as a correct definition. It's entirely possible that even after hearing all of the various discoveries that have led so many professionals to reconsider their own views on sex and gender, one can still hold on to the conflated view. And don't get me wrong, it has its utility. But by my lights, at least, the discoveries we've covered here alone reveal the very heavy cost of maintaining that definition. And the price is chiefly paid, sadly, by people like Jane and her loved ones. Now, one could, of course, weave a way to account for the aforementioned discoveries and findings without separating sex from gender. One could say, for instance, fine, sexual attraction isn't based on gametes and chromosomes, Rather, it's based on secondary sexual characteristics, genitalia, behaviours, and aesthetics. There, heterosexual people still exist. But to this, I have two points. 
First, note that this doesn't at all address any of the other massive issues that have been raised. You'd still be telling Jane that he's not a mum, for instance. And if you don't want to do this, you're going to have to buy another bullet, and yet another bullet when you come to dealing with one of the other issues that have been raised, and so on. Basically, the view becomes incredibly clumsy. Second, and more importantly, if you're willing to dispense of the binary when it comes to sexual attraction, why not dispense of it when it comes to gender? If sexual attraction isn't strictly related to sex, that is, gamete type, then why have gender strictly relate to sex? You've already made the biggest concession. Why not simply say that sex refers to gamete type and chromosomes, and gender relates to a social construct that heavily correlates with secondary sexual characteristics, genitalia, behaviours, and aesthetics? That is, why not say that sex is biological, whereas gender is a social construct? By doing this, you will have a much easier time solving the issues that have been raised throughout this video. You can recognise that some males are women, and some females are men, and you don't have to maintain an old view that frankly destroys the lives of so many. Jane is a mum because she fits the social construct of a woman and has brought up her children with love and care. Yes, she's a male, but being female isn't, per this set of definitions, a necessary condition for womanhood. And yes, Jane didn't give birth to her children, but as someone who bounced around in foster care, I can tell you that a mum isn't the person that gave birth to you. It's the woman that raised you. The Guardians of the Galaxy got this one right. He may have been your father, boy, but he wasn't your daddy. That scene, oh, it gets me in the feels. Damn it, Yondu. Now, sure, if you want to insist that a mum is a biological parent, then go ahead. There are no right definitions, but I view that as pretty damn weak. Anyhow, in the next episode, we're going to expand on the social construct view of gender, so be sure to subscribe and hit the bell and all that other stuff to be notified. In wrapping up, I'd like to express my utmost gratitude to Forrest Valkai for his time. If you'd like to see our full conversation, in which we talk at length about gender as well as sex, then please find the link below. Lastly, and as always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to the supporters of the channel. Without your financial support, videos like this simply wouldn't exist.